All right. Well, welcome everyone. I am Amy Pizlkowski here with Pallavi Aswara, and we are the co-chairs for the Professional Development Committee. And this is our very first Professional Development Committee Lunch and Learn. And we're very excited about this. Um, I just have a couple of uh, slides to go through because some of you joining today are not GCC members. And so welcome to um, our wonderful community of professionals. Um, let's see if I can advance here. So everybody seeing our uh, mission statement and nope. Okay, let me figure this out. We see your welcome slide. Okay, I'm gonna try to- There we go. Something. Okay. Yep. All right, good. It paused for some reason. So we are uh, an international organization of career and professional development professionals serving mostly PhDs, but also master's students and postdocs. And um, we've been around for uh, incorporated for about seven years now. And, um, you know, we really are a group of folks that um, collaborate, share our wisdom and our knowledge and our experiences and our resources quite freely with one another. And we're just excited to um, welcome those of you that have never experienced a GCC um, event before to our um, community today. So here's our professional development committee. We started meeting in um, August and we've already drafted a report to the GCC board outlining some of our um, priorities for the spring semester. And thanks to their great work, um, we have more workshops coming up for you to enjoy. In February on the 23rd, we'll be sharing more about the report and ways that we envision bringing more professional development to the GCC membership um, going forward. So we hope that you'll all sign up for that one and, and come back again um, to learn more. We have developed some competency frameworks for professionals in the field that we're going to share with you and in a, in a, just a whole lot of other information. And we're also hoping to gain your insights through that session as well in terms of opportunities that you're interested in um, for your professional development. Uh, we also have a host of regional meetings coming up. And so if you haven't signed up for your regional meeting or really because they're all virtual, you can go to any region um, and even connect with colleagues from all over the country and learn even more at our regional meetings. Uh, those you can register um, for through our website. And just some program notes, we are recording as you all know, and um, we will send out an evaluation at the end of the program and feel free to enter your uh, questions into the chat and Pallavi and I will moderate the chat and interrupt Christine um, and make sure that all your questions are answered. And lastly, I'd like to introduce Christine Kelly to you. Christine um, is a longtime member of the GCC. We actually joined the same year in 2008. Um, she has uh, just done so much for the organization. She's past president and she was pretty much the inspiration behind the Carpe Careers the Inside Higher Ed uh, series that you can find on Inside Higher Ed. She is the director of career development at Claremont Graduate University and um, has just developed a lot of, of wonderful programs over the years that she's generously shared with GCC colleagues. And today she's gonna to tell us a little bit about her reorientation program from, from student to scholar, helping PhDs candidates move from that coursework to completion um, stage. And also I just wanna say, one thing you might not know about Christine is that she's also like a crafts person and art, art artist. And she designs amazing woodwork, benches, all kinds of things she creates. So sometime ask Christine to show you her portfolio of her artwork because it's quite astounding. And I think that's where she gets a lot of her creativity from. So that's with my that, career. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Christine and I'm gonna stop sharing slides in case you have some slides you wanna share. I do, so. Um... Let's see, is it going to let me share? There we go. Thank you 
So I just have a few slides that I want to show, but I'm, I'm really excited to be the, the first person to be able, whoops, that's not what I meant to do, um, to uh, do a, a lunch and learn. So that's great. Um, so um, I just, I want this to be as interactive as possible. I also was telling Amy, I've created a folder with a lot of information about the program, um, surveys that we use, other things. I might kind of run you through at the end and kind of show you that, but I'm going to give that to her and she didn't upload all of that into the GCC site. Uh, so you can have that because again, I'm a big believer in not reinventing the wheel. So um, feel free to borrow uh, whatever you think might be useful to you. Um, and to ask more questions, even after this is over, as you start to do things, if there's maybe more material that you think I might have that would be helpful to you, I just put the things that I kind of thought. Um, and, you know, who knows, maybe I've got something else that you need. Um, I wanted to draw attention to the design on the left, the puzzle piece. Uh, when we started thinking about reorientation, one of the things we were brainstorming is kind of how to conceptualize it for students. And we were kind of thinking if we're giving them the pieces to the puzzle of the completion parts, because as you all know, the coursework part is relatively easy. It's very, there's a syllabus, there's things to do, there's timelines, there's all of that. So students typically don't have a hard time with the coursework, but then when it comes to the after coursework part, when it's all just a do some stuff and I'll tell you when I think you're finished, um, people have a hard time navigating that space. And we noticed that we had a lot of students who had finished coursework and then were kind of stalled out um, either in the quals process or made it through quals and got stalled at proposal writing or you know wrote the proposal, everything went great. And then it comes to writing the dissertation and then just nothing. Um, and obviously with all of us, our goal is to help students complete because it's hard to see students come invest all the time and energy in it and leave without a degree. Uh, or to get a second master's or something as opposed to the PhD. And so we wanted to work on helping students to succeed. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, again, how it started, who we invite, some of the programming and some of the stakeholder engagement. And I do have some slides about the programming to show you that, you know, what we do. So um, when I was came to CGU, I worked closely. I was part of, at the time, it was called the Student, Student Success Center, which was ironic, there was no center, but it was uh, my office for development, the Preparing Future Faculty Program and uh, the Writing Center that we kind of worked together. We had the same boss and we talk about things. And so all of us started to notice things with students that were late stage in their program. Uh, sometimes like being really unaware of the services that were available to them and that could help them through the struggle, uh, but also that um, the attrition rate increases when people are done with coursework. That's when a lot of times people, again, lose motivation and drop out. Uh, and sometimes it's because they don't know how to go through the process. Um, and I'm sure you've all uh, listened to students too who don't know how to work with an advisor. There's no training on that. Um, and in fact, it's ironic that in grad school, even when you think your students, when you're a professor, a PI, you think your students are going to be faculty, no one ever sits them down and teaches them how to mentor other people and how to be a good advisor. That's just not something that's discussed. Um, so we started to kind of brainstorm for things that we heard students mentioning as some of the issues uh, that they had. Um, in terms of who we invite, we decided to invite anybody who had, in our case, completed 48 units of coursework. So that means they're pretty well done with their coursework. So we wanted to, um, instead of just doing people who are completely finished, get those people who maybe had one class left and could benefit from a program like this. Um, so um, we, uh, it's, you know, I go into PeopleSoft, download a list and, and can find people by those indicators. Uh, and we invite them. So we use Handshake at our school. So I set the thing up in Handshake and send out regular invites through Handshake. We also communicate with the faculty and ask them to encourage their advisees uh, to come. That was a little bit of a challenge in the first year or two we did it because they, uh, they didn't know what the program was about. They didn't know what it was going to do. And, you know, faculty always think that whatever they do is brilliant and staff do things that, you know, aren't helpful. Um, but uh, their students started reporting to them that they got a lot out of the experience. And so it helped us to get more of the faculty buy-in 
uh, for that. So we always ask them to recommend uh, students for that uh, as well. Um, and then uh, programming. Um, let me just kind of skip to the next shot, slide and show you some of what we do. So these are the themes that we are that we consistently hit on, uh, and we think this is kind of the secret sauce that students need. The only thing that's going to be different this year, or the main thing besides just being completely online, is we're not doing the faculty panel this year. In the past, that's been the thing the students have loved the most. We invite faculty to talk to students about what it was like for them completing their, uh, their doctoral work. And so it's really good for students to hear that their professors struggle with some of the same things that they did with trying to balance their life, their work, their other responsibilities, trying to figure out how you navigate that process and, and do uh, independent research. So that's something that students uh, really enjoy uh, hearing from. Um, then we find that uh, sometimes people have a hard time kind of mapping the process. And so the Imagine PhD um, tools have been really helpful for us and we've incorporated those uh, because they've got the program completion goals, skill building goals and career development goals. So the past couple of years, we've been talking about process mapping and showing them different ways to do it and incorporating Imagine PhD so that they can see those tools. Um, obviously, you know, writing after coursework is a challenge in doing the dissertation. And at CGU, our writing center has done dissertation boot camps for ever. So it's just kind of a thing they do. But again, it's something that students don't really know about. And so we were trying to do that, getting them to also understand research tools, because my colleague who is in the preparing future faculty was finding people didn't know how to use ResearchGate or Mendeley or any of those other uh, tools for managing your projects. And so we're taking a long time. And we sometimes would have uh, people from the library come in and talk about some of those things as well. Um, and then for beyond the dissertation, um, I don't know about your conversations with students, but I've found that some are kind of hanging around in grad school because they absolutely have no idea what to do next. And so grad school is kind of safe uh, for them, but at some point they have to get out <laughs> because the funding runs out or some other thing uh, makes them. And so we wanted to work on having them plan, uh, make career plans. And then also creating our persona and by scholarly persona, we don't mean just faculty, but broadly, how do you create that professional persona for yourself? Um, and that's part of that process of you know, professionalizing yourself for whatever you're going to do. Um, and then the motivation and time management, managing burnout, all of those are issues. And we have some faculty who can speak to those. We have a positive psych program. So we pull on the faculty. Um, and then again, making them actually create some semblance of a plan. When we first started doing orientation, uh, we were doing a lot of giving of information. And uh, we found after that, that we actually needed to encourage students more and, and bring them in more to make connections with things and actually make them do something. Um, so you'll see in our schedules that they actually have homework to do. Um, uh, for that. So we want them to actually kind of make progress towards something. So they leave with some semblance of a plan. So this, oh, I see there's questions. Should I stop yeah. now and take questions? Yeah. Let's, let's handle a couple of these questions. Um, and thank you everybody for your questions and folks chiming in with, with, um, various resources and information. So question from Sean, are you asking faculty, um, to recommend to all their advisees or particular students just in need? Um, we ask, we, well, we ask them to identify students who they think would, would benefit from it because some students, I mean, and I think also, and, I, and this will happen more, there are some students who will need everything and some students who might need pieces of. Uh, and so I think what we're moving towards this year because of having to be um, virtual, is that we have chunked it up a little bit more and we're actually creating a Canvas site with more resources in it and some other things that students can pull from. So we're trying to kind of bring together things that we know that they need so they can go to one place and get it all. We have a couple of different things where we've tried to do that uh, for students and working towards that. But, um, you know, again, 
I, it kind of depends on the student. There are some who have their stuff together, know exactly what they're going to do and whip through programs in record time. Um, and maybe this isn't something they need. Uh, but every advisor knows who on their list like that they haven't heard from in a year or that they know it, it could benefit from the program. Yeah, that's great. That's really helpful. And then there's other um, questions coming in around, you know, is this something that you offer just to grad students after they pass their qualifying exams or is there some benefit to offering it prior to qualifying? No, it's actually pre-qual. So we invite everyone who's completed coursework. So that would be people who are in the qual stage or who are in the proposal stage or dissertation writing stage. And in fact, we um, one of the things that's in the folder that I'll send is we do a registration survey and we ask students where they are in the process so that when we're seeing who's coming to the event, we know how many people are in, who, how many people are pre-quals, how many people are you know, pre-proposal and how many are dissertating um, so that we have a feel for who's coming uh, to the meeting. But definitely people, we want to get them before they hit quals because I'm sure you see the same thing at your school. In some cases, quals are very clear and this is what you need to do. Like our humanities folks, um, they're nuts. They got to figure something out because they tell students, why don't you go out and read a ton of books and then maybe we'll talk about what you're going to do. Uh, there's, I mean, there's no consistency on how many books you have to read or what timeline or how the questions are going to come. Um, our psychology program, on the other hand, says that we have this portfolio of things you do. So there's eight things in the portfolio. So they're thinking we got it all figured out, except for one of the portfolio items is a publishable paper. Now, no one knows what that means. If they said get a paper published, that's clear. Um, and so students get stuck because there's also disagreements among faculty about what counts as a publishable paper. So there's a whole lot that people need to know about that process. And so kind of the sooner the better. So I know some of you probably also do um, first year experience programs with your graduate students. We try to do that too and, and inform them of some of the things that are going to come up and how grad school is going to work, um, especially the part that you're going to lose your self-esteem at some point along the way. Um, so helping them figure out how to navigate that process. And, and one other really quick question before we go on is how many times per semester do you offer the reorientation session? We actually have only done this once a year. Um, other people have suggested that you should do it more than once a year. Um, I think it's possible if we move things online to do it more frequently. When we've done it in person, it takes more time and energy getting the faculty together, getting all the planning, getting the room. I mean, you, you all know how challenging it is to lock, plan a large event. Um, so we've only done it once uh, because it is typically a day long thing um, and not just an hour or two. Great. All right. There's a few more questions coming in. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to take questions or keep going? Oh, well, sure. Let's have sure. questions. Okay, um, ha perhaps you'll talk about this more later in the presentation, but she's curious, this is Amy from Madison. She's curious how if, curious if how you found Imagine PhD useful for students in the STEM field, which we know STEM PhDs are using Imagine PhD. And then um, kind of a, a tag on question, Sal asks um, how you built in the exploration through the dissertation phase of your program at the two o'clock, we can see that, um, when it, we know it's very time consuming for those that are um, exploring diverse careers and um, trying to dissertate at the same time. Right, right. Um, well, at CGU, we don't have STEM. Uh, we have social science and humanities. I mean, our STEMish programs, we do have a math Institute of Mathematical Sciences but most of those students are in a joint program and they go off and do their own thing in faculty. They don't really interact with most the rest of the campus very much There's very few of them. And our students that are in our computer science and information systems program, that's not hardcore STEM uh, for, for that. So I haven't really used that tool with STEM people per se. The people that we have are mostly humanistic social scientists. Even again, our people that are in CISAT are not hardcore programmers. They're more on the information technology data science type of things. And so a little different population. 
Um, I think the thing I like about the tool for Imagine PhD is I'm a very visual person. So that drag and drop feature is wonderful for me. Um, I, you know, it's nice that you've got the different time plans that you could do. I think some of the things that you have to complete are the same regardless of what your uh, focus is, degree area. But if you didn't use Imagine PhD and you had a lot of STEM students, you could also use the tool um, My IDP, which Imagine PhD um, was inspired by. Uh, so if the folks that you're working with don't respond or relate to Imagine PhD, you could use the other tool. Thank you, Christine. I think for now. Okay, cool. All right, so um, this is the sample schedule from last year, so you can think, see the things that we do. So. Uh, one of the things that we started doing that was new last year is an index card of having them uh, write a note to themselves about what their intention was for the day. We actually ask them to think about that, like to tell us what's one thing they hope to get out of the programming when we do the uh, survey, when they sign up for the event, so that we have an idea of what people's expectations are. But we thought that if they had to write a note to themselves about it, that might help them to focus uh, on what they're going to do uh, for that. Uh, we typically have someone from the ad administration level do an introduction for us. In the past, we've had the president or vice provost. Last year, we had uh, this person with a really long title who's my boss. <laughs> uh, then obviously, again, the faculty panelists. And so we just have someone moderate and we ask in the survey, uh, the registration survey, what questions the students have, because we know sometimes you get students in a room with faculty and none of them wants to say anything. Um, so we ask in advance what those questions are and then we pose them to faculty. And I think once that starts going, then students feel comfortable asking questions uh, as well. And again, these kind of follow the different um, planning things that you can see. I mean, someone asked a question about the kind of career planning and managing the, the time uh, and searching. So one of the things that's also different with where I am as opposed to where a good portion of you are, um, I'm at a private university. So students still have access to resources after they graduate. So I can still work with students at that point uh, we do have conversations about uh, breaking up little things that they can do along the way. So our goal is to try and get them to start thinking about their career and career planning as soon as they get to CGU. So I created an entering student survey when I got there, asked questions about what people's career background is. So I know I share that with faculty so they can get a snapshot of their students. And then I go around to faculty and I tell them how important it is for students to start working on this stuff earlier rather than later, um, because it's frustrating for everybody at that point when you're stressed out, you got to get a job and you have no time uh, to do that. So we continually send out messages about that. A couple of years ago, we started doing the career readiness conference the first week of the semester in the fall. Uh, where we introduce people to the things that they need to know and the resources that we have to try and get them off to a good start. Um, and then we continue to obviously try to, I think with the first year experience, students are invited to that and that encourages them to, uh, you know, hopefully to take more of an active role in their professional development throughout the time at CG rather than waiting until the end uh, to do everything. So that's kind of my goal and what I've been working for. In fact, that was something I wrote into my strategic plan when I got there was that I wanted to integrate professional development into the core of um, uh, the graduate program. And in some of the departments, a lot of the students, like in our psych program, very few of the students actually go on for faculty jobs. Um, there's still a lot in the humanities who all think that they're going to be the next great literature professor. Um, and so it's a little challenging sometimes to um, help you know, navigate. But I've also done um, a workshop on careers for humanists that I presented 
at MLA a couple of times and I do versions of that. Um, and the Dean of the School of Humanities and the past Dean have been very supportive of the wide range of things other than being a faculty person uh, that you can do. But that's where I also work closely with my colleague in preparing future faculty so that we can identify students who kind of need some extra coaching and training even around how to find an academic or how to find a faculty job because that's another thing faculty don't teach you. they expect that you'll know how to do it just from being around them so i find that there's a lot of uh, information gaps for people on how to do any of this uh, and so it's kind of working towards helping them fill those gaps so that's kind of what, oh, and then we started actually the letter to future self too um, last year. So having students before they leave the event, um, it'll be harder this time because, you know, we're all going to be virtual. So we won't know what they do before they leave. But we gave them all an envelope uh, and told them to write a letter to themselves about what they, how, for however out long they be, you know, six months. Uh, or a year and you know where they wanted to be at that time and what they wanted to have accomplished so that they put again put some goals on paper and had that with them and we actually I do we do a survey immediately after the event we do a survey at six months out and we do a survey at a year out um, so we constantly kind of poke them um, to remind them that there's other things that they need to do uh, and to keep in contact. And I actually do have some, just some stats on some of those uh, outcome results. Um, so this is gonna be this year's event. We're doing it over the course of a week because um, there's no way you're gonna get people to sit in a Zoom room all day long. Um, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> so we figured students wouldn't. So we broke it up into chunks throughout the week. And then this year we're gonna have both synchronous and asynchronous events. Uh, so that students can um, work. And last year we had started building out the canvas shell for it, but uh, kind of got stalled on that. But this year we're really working to build that out and to put a lot of good resources in there so that students can access whenever they need them for that. But um, here's some of the some of the things we've discovered from our with the demographic information that we do for students. So we started asking about whether or not they did had internships or teaching experience. So from the beginning, 2016, when we did that in 2018, we started asking specifically about career goals and plans. So in 2018, 12 of the 55 people who registered weren't sure of their career goal and only 14 had a career, a clear plan. In 2019, 15 out of the 63 were not sure of their career goal and 16 had a a clear career plan. So that's again information is important for me to know because afterwards I can still communicate with these people and say, hey, you know, you, if you indicated that you're not quite sure what you're doing or where you're going, it's a great time to come in and have a conversation uh, with me. And I do actually get now a good amount of faculty referrals. And so that's been good over time to build those connections with faculty. And again, I know it's easier for me because my school is very small, there's 175 faculty as opposed to some of your institutions that are ginormous. Um, so I do have an easier go of that. Um, and then these are just some things we found consistently um, over the past uh, years that we've been doing this, that the immediate impact that students do report, that they can proactively approach completion um, and proactively approach their career development, that they think they can complete in a timely manner, um, use resources, approach faculty, and address barriers. Um, and again, you might think, well, why wouldn't you approach faculty? Um, depending on what it is, some students have closer relationships with faculty than others, and some are just frankly scared of their advisors and just don't know how to have that conversation, talk to them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the out things that came out of uh, this event. Whoops. And then, uh, oops skipping too fast. Okay, so the six months to a year, we found that people had taken steps towards reaching their goals, that they had designed a career plan, used resources, did approach faculty, and did address some of their barriers. Uh, and so those were good things, because what we're trying to do actually is to kind of look at connecting this to um, program completion. So we have, like I mentioned, there's, you know, three, there's now four offices involved in it, because our um, 
transdisciplinary uh, program is involved in this as well. But for those of us who actually actively see students, it's my department, the Preparing Future Faculty Program, and the Center for Writing and Rhetoric. So we're looking at who came to um, reorientation and who also engaged with our offices and then looking at time to completion. So what we have that as the long-term goal. Um, we have PeopleSoft that we use and it allows you to do milestone markers. And so we can go into PeopleSoft. We haven't started doing this yet. We've been doing this all outside of PeopleSoft because we just got the milestones last year, but we can start putting indicators on somebody's record if they participated in re reorientation and if they visited our offices. So we can start to look at that impact from actually you know, coming and, and working with us. Oops. And then some of the things that have come out of this time, um, the early and early thing was the ASK workbook, which is an academic success kit. So through our discussions of things that students don't know about, but they really need to, uh, we created a workbook that um, in the first two years of it, it was actually a physical book and students were supposed to, we gave it to everybody who, um, started at the time they started in their orientation, they got that book and they were supposed to bring it with them to their advising appointments or to any meetings they had on campus so that they would have a record of things that they had done um, and it directed them to all the resources on campus. Um, that's now fully online uh, so students can use that. Uh, the academic, uh, the Delmany Academic Professional, uh, yes, two developments, anyway, Academic Professional Development Pod. Um, that's our offices. And so we have always been trying to help students see the connections of why they should work with the Career Development Office, with Preparing Future Faculty, with Transdisciplinary Studies and the Writing Center and how all of us work together to help them, you know, develop as a professional on the academic side. So we, we're not attached to student services. We're on the academic side of the house. Um, and so we've been trying to communicate to students. So we have a website now that links individually to all of our departments, but we have content of here are the things we do together. Um, and this is why working with all, all of us together is you know, stronger than maybe one at a time. Um, and we all refer each other to you know, different resources too. And then the advising video series, I presented on that actually at GCC in 2019. Also when I presented um, on reorientation with um, Jackie. And uh, again, there are things, questions you know that students have about how to work with the advisor. And so I, we worked and wrote down all the questions that students have that we know. And I interviewed faculty about all of those different questions and I created a series of videos. So they're all about 10 minutes in length and there's, I think, like 20 of them or something. They're on the, G, uh, the GCC web, oh, excuse me, CGU website. Um, and if you want to borrow them and link to them, that's totally fine. Just make sure that you, you know, give a shout out that these are at CGU. Uh, they were done, but it's things like, you know, how do you switch advisors? And how do you have a conversation with your advisor? What are you supposed to, you know, how do you set expectations? So some of those things, or there's even, you know, one of what if you have a conflict with your advisor. We had some faculty that were, you know, very open with students about how to deal uh, with some other situations. And so those are things that have come out of us talking about and working on reorientation. So that's all the slides I have. Great. We've got some questions in the chat. Maybe we can um, address and then we'll just open it up for the remainder of the time. Um, I know some of you offer similar programs, so feel free to post links. Thank you, Jackie and others. Um, so the first question is about um, the um, attendees. Do they see the schedule as they are signing up? So they, do they know the agenda as they're coming in? Yes, when I put the event handshake, it has the agenda in at times, all that stuff, so they know what they're signing up for. Okay. Uh, and so when they register, they know what it's going to be. Okay, and I think I missed a question before that. Is yeah, What is your feedback rate six months to one year out? I think you covered a little bit of that data. Yeah, it's it's not as great as you'd like it to be. Um, you know, it hovers around 10%. So yeah, it's not everybody, but, um, you know, so you can't, you know, I think it's, sometimes we know too, because you can look at what, if someone completed. So somebody, we sometimes get back, like they don't give feedback, except for I finished. So 
<laughs> so specifically, you know, they're done. Because, um, yeah, it'd be great if you could get 100%, but, you know, no one ever does. Um, but actually, we one of the things that I put in the uh, folder that I'll send to uh, Amy is we did a survey last year before the before we did our very first reorientation, we did a survey of students to find out what their perceived barriers were. It was really, really long, uh, but we used that in creating the programming. Last year, we did a much shorter one. And out of the, I think there were about 800 students that we sent it to, we got over 350 responses. And that was students telling us what their barriers were, whether or not they thought they were making timely progress towards the different aspects of their completion. So, you know, good information that we're getting and, and able to use in terms of all of our programming. Thank you, Christine. Um, please feel free to post your questions in the chat box. Draw Christine's attention. So a question to you, how many people work with you to put this together? Did you hear that question, Christine? No, I didn't. How yeah, many sorry. People, how many people work with you to put this together? Um there's let's see, this year I've got two for seven full-time staff. And then in my office, I have student staff that typically help out with it. This year, we don't need the student staff as much because we don't have the on the ground thing. So it's mostly just the full-time uh, staff that we have working on it. And so we meet pretty regularly anyway. Um, so for us kind of talking about this is in light of what we do and it's the one collaborative project project all our offices do together um, but it, it's not like it takes us all all of the time to do it we usually start planning in November so the planning timelines in there too and some of the stuff in November is logistics stuff um, and since we have done this this many times we feel pretty good about the content that we have um, although this year we were going to change it up quite a bit but given what COVID did to everybody, we kind of went, mm, let's kind of keep it with what we've done in the past and those work and we'll talk about more later. So there's also a couple documents that I put into the folder that are some of the discussions we've had about what we should do or can do in the future. So there's just some other idea documents in there as well. That's great. And feel free if anybody has ideas now that you've sort of seen the framework, um, other ideas you have for this type of programming. How did you decide on holding it in March? Is that when you is that when you hold it typically? Um, actually, in the past, it's always been the first Friday in February. Um, but again, this year, COVID just kind of messed everything up for us. And so usually, like I said, we start planning this in November. Um, so that we're good to go. And despite my best efforts to kick people's butts starting in October to talk about this, yeah. I kept getting stalled. Oh, I can't do that now. I can't do that. So it just got to a point where here we were in December and we hadn't sent out any information about it. Students were just about to go on break. Faculty, you know, they, they don't answer emails during a break. So we pushed it back to March to give us more time to be able to, uh, for us, and I'm sure for most of you, schools started back up again, um, Martin Luther King week. Um, and so we figured that gives us two months to, to get the notice out, which is typically how much time we have. Um, so the reason it's in March this year was just a planning thing. Um, and we're again, less concerned oftentimes with the specific academic calendar a little on this one, since most of the students are done with coursework. So we don't really butt up too much about people. It's like, oh, I have classes, so I can't go. Um, that's happened for a few folks, but um, you know, again, you can work around those types of things. Okay, great. So I've got a barking dog in the background here. So apologies up front. Any recommendations on what, if anything, you might do to adapt this pro type of program specifically to supporting students from historically underrepresented backgrounds? Porter just wanted to make an appearance, that's all. 
Yeah, so um, we actually have a separate program that started a year ago called Thrive, which is part of our FYE experience. And so that's a program designed for students of color um, to BIPOC students to help them kind of navigate the process and have a safe space to talk about some of these things. Um, this year, we have a speaker who is going to, he's a a friend of uh, my assistant director who uh, finished his PhD in 2018 and he just got a faculty job recently. So he's going to talk about um, navigating the, the environment while black. Um, and so we do have a special program this year addressing that uh, community uh, and, and giving them an opportunity to hear from someone who has experience of navigating. There's also been a lot of training on our campus around faculty because we do have a good number of students of color. So they've received some training on how to work with people from uh, those groups. So there has been some movement on that. Uh, but again, that's the Thrive program really speaks to that uh, piece. But yeah, there's more we could do. Uh, and that, and I think in all of us talking about it, we try to, because we actually have a different student profile than most of you as well. Um, we don't have undergrads. We're hundred percent grads all the time. So we have very few TAs, very few RAs. Most of the students that come to CGU are paying it, paying for it by themselves. Some of them by working full time. So we also have more of a commuter audience uh, for that or the ones that aren't commuters are um, you know, working. Uh, and, and kind of limit some of their time and gives them a different experience. Uh, and so that's uh, a, a different profile for graduate students as well. And some of the things I think that we talk about that sometimes does create a challenge because they're not around as much to actually see their faculty people once they're done with coursework. Um, so that's been uh, a challenge, but actually one of the things they're doing at CG2 that I'm really impressed by is they're making all of the faculty write the core competencies they're teaching for their programs. <laughs> so um, it's been a struggle because faculty don't want to think about that stuff because I'm just brilliant. They're learning stuff from me, um, but it's been good that they've been pushed to do that and to really think about those topics. And again, that sometimes encourages them to have conversations with me about those core competencies and how they could show up in a workplace. Great, yeah. Uh, so I skipped a question um, about <laughs> surveys. Ooh, sorry, gotta get the treats out. Um, so, and any of you thinking about getting a puppy, just reach out. Um, so <laughs> surveys, are they anonymous and um, do you, or not so that you can reach out and connect with students to, to continue the support? The survey that they do at time of registration is connected to them uh, because it's through Handshake. When we send out the exit, well, they send out the survey immediately after in a six month and the one year, um, we send out anonymous link so that they don't need to indicate who they are. But since I have them all in Handshake, all the people who attended, I can send and have sent them messages through Handshake. Hey, you know, hey, you know, if you need some help, these offices are still available to help you. So um, that's one of the things that's really good with using a system. I don't know if simplicity allows this, but when I download the list of students from PeopleSoft, I label them in Handshake. So it will say reorientation for the year that they're eligible. Um, and there's some students that have been eligible over multiple years, obviously, because you know it's not like, hey, I finished coursework and a year later I'm done. Um, so there are some who've been invited multiple times, but since they're all labeled, I can send messages to students through the system just based on those labels. Excellent. Thanks, Christine. And thanks for posting links. Um, some of you are just like on top of this in the chat. So grab those links um, and we'll, we'll save the chat as well. Um, is the Canvas shell different than the event or is it just supplemental resources? Um, no, Canvas is a learning management system. So uh, that's what faculty is for courses. So in Canvas, we can put the videos, we can put resources. So it's something that only students at CG would have access to. Uh, 
Um, but it's like it's like a class, an online class type of thing. So it's how you would manage all your materials. So faculty use those for coursework, even when we're in person, because they can put their syllabus there. Students can turn in assignments. So there are things like that, like um, Moodle's a system like that, or was that Blackboard? So it's something like that. And then what we're thinking of doing once we build that out is also inviting everybody that's eligible for reorientation to participate and to use that resource. And so it won't just be the people who are able to attend the event. So that can also help us to broaden our reach and get people who weren't able to attend sessions live. Um, and we're recording all of our sessions so they're available uh, after. And now that we know that there's closed captioning, that makes it even better. Yeah, what do you, uh, what's been your uptake rate, uptake rate on folks participating in the Canvas course, kind of, um, what's it called, uh, asynchronously and watching the videos there compared to um, participating? This, yeah, this year will be uh, newer. Last year, we had a few conversations, but we didn't really build it out enough last year. Um, so this year, but it allows you to track metrics. And so you can see how many times a, a person's logged in and what they've looked at and all of that. So it's nice to be able to look at those things. So we can see from students, like we used it, uh, we did uh, my colleague in preparing future faculty. I do a careers in higher ed conference in the fall, generally, again, not this year because everyone was crazy. And we've used Canvas to continue the conversations. Like we gave people assignments and then we, uh, had them turn them in through um, that Canvas site. And then we uh, had conversations with the people who attended the event through that site. And students are pretty used to using it. Great, great, great. Um, yeah, anybody have any other questions? Or um, I know some of you run similar programs and you wanna unmute and share some thoughts about um, some of the features that might be similar or different or successful from your programs. I, I won't call on you, but feel free to, to unmute. And, and Christine, can you stop sharing slides at this point? Oh, sorry. Yeah, but that's okay. No problem. That way we can see everybody that's great. All right, um, let's see. All right, I'm gonna to have to start. I'll just, I'll just pipe in. So I, I was co-presented -pres with Christine after, hey, and she really, in, hey, she really inspired me when I saw her presentation at Berkeley to do something similar at UBC, uh, a little bit different scope of university. I serve about 10,000 graduate students. Uh, so we implemented it as, uh, so we do a couple different things. One is we do a first year PhD connections lunch. So throughout, um, now of course it's not lunch, it used to be buffet at one of our graduate student residences, but we've moved it online uh, to Zoom and remarkably students actually come, but we do that traditionally four times a year. This year it's only two times a year. And it's like orientation throughout the first year for PhDs. And then with that, then we move to candidacy to completion. So every six months, I email every PhD candidate or who's reached candidacy and invite them to what was a lunch, but now, and the Dean comes and welcomes them. It's a shorter version, but it's really part celebration, part reminder of resources and also just connecting to your peers. And we have other graduate students there and really they, the lovely thank yous we get. And also just one of the take homes is it's so nice to know the university actually knows I exist because they just get off into their, you know, niche areas and research. And they really think that no one cares about what they're doing. And so it's just a nice way to reconnect and say, hey, you know what, we do care and we want you to succeed. And there's all sorts of things that we're doing to try to help with your mental health, with your career success, with professional development. Uh, so it's been really positive experience for us. Yeah, that's actually something I forgot to mention. We actually I brought in other resources too. So we did invite the counseling center to come and there's a couple other um, OBSA, the um, Office of Black Student Affairs and Jacono Latino Student Affairs. And we had representatives from those who we invited to lunch uh, so that students could also have an opportunity to meet with people with some of those extra resources that were part of a consortium. So those are resources that are shared amongst all the consortium. Uh, and so sometimes students are a little less aware of those because they're not physically on the CGD campus. 
Um, so we did that. And actually, you know, the, the mental health, especially, I think for a lot of students, they comment on how nice it was to hear that they're not alone in going through the isolation and the feelings that they have. Again, when their faculty tell them that, when they meet some of their colleagues, you're like, yeah, I'm feeling that too, because it's so easy to think you're the only one. So to Morris's question, we don't use the term mandatory in Canada, <laughs> at least not at University of British Columbia. So everything is strongly encouraged. Yeah, no, we don't use that either. I don't think I don't think that would go over well with graduate students to say you have to. Unless their advisor tells them they have to, then they do. <laughs> Christine, I'd be curious, and I mean, you've got a smaller school with 175 faculty, but one of the things we're really working on is uh, what we're calling great grad program, but really working with faculty members to embed some of these conversations within their own programs. And I do presentations within faculties and departments on how to have a plan for graduate school. I mean, I think it's something that we all do as part of our day jobs, uh, but how do you really yeah, get them where they're at in their departments and working on these annual plans and having strategies and we're talking about it at their committees. I guess that's your ask uh, mm -hmm. tool book, but how they actually use them. Um, I think we've had a harder time getting faculty to adopt some of those tools and use them. Um, and, and so that's been a challenge, but I think, you know, some of these things, because it, it is small and because students are investing a lot of money in it, there's been a push from the vice provost to the deans to do something about some of these issues. And so there's been that push that you're less likely to get, you know, how it is with, you know, faculty not wanting to, uh, to do things, but um, they've actually encouraged some that, you know, if this isn't working for you, maybe there's another school that you prefer to go to. Um, so a couple of the problem children faculty have left. Um, and then I think when they bring new ones in, they started doing a new faculty orientation a couple of years ago and inviting our offices to come and speak to new faculty so that they know about the resources that are available to students. Because we all know that not all faculty were at a university that had graduate level career services or might be one of those people who just never darkened the doors of it and so have absolutely no clue about all these other resources that are available to students. And so that started a couple of years ago and having the provost and even the president um, on your side and pushing these things and talking about them and making student success part of the, we have new North Star goals and so, my boss's job is uh, seeing about completion. So all these things are kind of now baked into how CGU operates. So it makes it a little bit easier. That's great. Thanks, Christine. We had a question from Amy Clovis from UVA about um, making, designing these kinds of programs so they're specific enough to students in certain departments, but broad enough, you know, that it's not too customized for one, you know, department over another. So any tips or advice on sort of how you walk that fine line? Yeah, well, our first reorientation, we actually split the day. We did the faculty panel. We did some writing strategies and career strategies everybody went to. But then we did breakouts. So we did, if you were in calls, you went to this. If you were in proposal writing, you went to this one. And if you were in uh, dissertation stage you went to that it was so it's different topic areas the problem that we experienced especially in the one for calls is that process is so different across this the colleges and we ended up with too many humanists on it one this is what we learned too about not vetting properly uh, panelists one of the students was known by um, uh, one of my colleagues so we thought she was okay but she unloaded her purse so to speak all over the table. And so it was kind of an uncomfortable situation for everybody. Um, but the comments we got in the evaluation was there wasn't anybody from my program. So all of the programs have program coordinators who know intimately the details of what the calls process is like. So we have them come to lunch and then students at lunch can meet with them. And we've also invited faculty to lunch. And so some students have actually gotten 
an advising session with their faculty member during lunch at reorientation, but others have a representative from their school and or, well, their department, because some of the schools have multiple departments, but they've had someone they can talk to about what that process is like, who knows what their program details are. Um, so that's helped us to uh, make it more specialized at some point, but broad enough to kind of co cover the things that are common amongst. Excellent. So I'm really mindful of time because I know we're like hopping from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting every day, all day. Um, and it's three minutes till four. So if you have to hop off, thank you for coming. And also thank you to Christine for sharing this information with us again. Um, it's always good review for those of us that attended her and Jackie's session in 2016, but it's always great for new members who are just gearing up these sorts of programs to learn from, from all of you who have, who have designed these wonderful um, programs. So thank you. And I'll put the link to the survey in the chat again. There's just four questions that we want you to answer if you're a GCC member, um, which will really help our committee design some more of these lunch and learns um, for you throughout 2021. So um, thank you all for attending and um, wherever you are, stay warm, stay safe, uh, wear your mask, get vaccinated and all those good things. And we'll hang out if anybody wants to just chat for a couple more minutes, but I'm gonna stop the recording now. Yeah, and um, feel free if you have more questions to um, reach out to me. Um, and like I said, I'm sending Amy a lot of stuff for her to put on the GCC site. So it'll have a lot of stuff. So after you look through it, if there's something, I might have more materials. So if there's something specific that you're looking for, ask. And if I have it, I'm happy to share.